How you doing guys, welcome to another video. This is the final volume in topic 15, energetics, thermochemistry. Let's get it done, go. Okay, so volume three, entropy and spontaneity. We talk about entropy, which is given the symbol S. We look at what is Gibbs free energy and then we discuss entropy changes. IB understandings and applications and skills revolve around this idea of entropy, Gibbs free energy, and then doing some calculations for those two things. We need to be able to make some predictions based on change in entropy, entropy and change in delta G, and a few other things. Okay, entropy, given the symbol delta S, is a term used for the randomness or disorder of a system. Now, I've got two images here. One is an extremely ordered system and one is a very unordered system. So the sandcastles on the left are very much a very ordered system. The sandcastle on the right is a less ordered system. The way you can think of this is on the left with the sandcastle that looks amazing, there's only really one way that I can put all of the bits of sand together. On the right, there's numbers and numbers of different ways that I could arrange those bits of sand and still get it looking the same way. A more ordered system has a negative delta S, or the change in entropy would be negative, and a less ordered system has a positive entropy, or a positive delta S. Now entropy refers to the distribution of available energy amongst the particles, and the more ways that you can distribute that energy, the higher the entropy. Now the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of a system will tend to increase over time. So just as you guys have been studying at the start, I bet you everything looked nice, clean, legit, and then over time it's just become a bit of a mess. So we say that over time the entropy of a chemical system tends to increase. Now in terms of solids, liquids and gases, we have solids which are very ordered low energy systems. We have gases that are high energy, less ordered systems. And changing from one to the other can increase the energy, which is also an increase in the entropy. So we say that a gas has more entropy than a liquid that has more entropy than a solid. So some of the factors that can increase the entropy of a system include things like dissolving an ionic compound, and the way you think of this is we've got a solid and then we've turned it into two aqueous solutions. Now something that's aqueous means that it's moving around randomly, so that means that the aqueous ions have more energy than the solid. So that means they have gained entropy. Their entropy has increased, they are more disordered, they're moving around randomly. So the delta S for a change like that would be positive. If we have a change of state, either going from a solid to a liquid, a liquid to a gas, or maybe sublimation from a solid to a gas, all of those things are increasing the disorder, which gives it a, all of those a positive delta S. If we have a decomposition reaction where we have a solid that then turns into a number of different products, and some of those products might be a gas, we've got more disorder in that reaction. So what's happened is the solid has broken down, we've released a gas, so that means that we've got a positive change in the entropy. So the delta S would be positive. Finally, simply if we increase the temperature, we give the particles more energy. If we're giving something more energy, the entropy must increase. So like enthalpy, Entropy can be measured under standard conditions. So the standard entropy change of a reaction would have the symbol delta S naught. And the standard entropy is the absolute entropy of a substance at 100 kPa and 298 Kelvin. The units for entropy though are slightly different. Joules per Kelvin or joules per Kelvin per mole. So it's really important that you remember that it's joules and not kilojoules. So many times students will forget that this is a joules relationship and not change it to kilojoules. A number of the entropies can be found in the data booklet on in table 12. So to calculate the entropy change in a system, we take the entropy of the products and take them away from the entropy of the reactants. For, so for example, find the entropy for the reaction given the following values in joules per Kelvin per mole. 
This is the Harbour process, nitrogen plus three times hydrogen goes to two ammonia, and we're given the values below. So to work out the entropy change, we have two times the entropy of ammonia, take away the entropy of nitrogen plus three times the entropy of hydrogen. The same type of calculation we would do to calculate delta H. Subbing in those numbers, we have two times 193, take away 192 plus three times 131. Just make sure you put things in brackets so when you use your calculator that you don't make a mistake for such a simple little reaction. So our change in entropy is negative 199 joules per Kelvin per mole. What does that mean? It means that that system has become more ordered. And if you look at the reaction, we have four gas moles on the left and two gas moles on the right. So we're actually got a lower amount of gas, which means the, sub, the reaction has become more ordered. There's less gas on the product side. You can find the values for a number of substances in the data book. So if they don't give it to you in the question, make sure you check out that table. Another example, find the entropy delta S naught for hydrogen, given that the carbon monoxide has an entropy of 198 joules per Kelvin per mole, and methanol has an entropy of 127 joules per Kelvin per mole, and we're given the change in entropy for this system. So this is just a case of coming up with the equation, delta S naught equals the entropy of the, the products, take away the entropy of the reactants, and then subbing in our values, but this time our hydrogen is our unknown. So the delta S naught that was given to us, negative 219 joules per Kelvin per mole. Our products, the methanol, that was given to us as well. Take away our reactants, which is carbon monoxide plus two times the hydrogen. And now it just comes down to a simple maths equation where we need to rearrange to find our unknown value. The first thing we need to do though is expand the brackets to make sure that we've got the right symbols between them. And then we can simplify by moving the like terms to both sides, which will leave us with an X value that we're able to calculate for the entropy of hydrogen, which in this case ends up being 74. So the entropy of hydrogen here is 74 joules per Kelvin per mole. Okay, so now we need to talk about spontaneity and what makes a reaction spontaneous. If we have a look at the Harbour process, where we have nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas forming ammonia, the reaction itself is exothermic. The change in entropy though is negative, so it becomes more ordered. Now the entropy of a reaction is not favoured to a spontaneous reaction. Something more ordered is not spontaneous. So in this case, whether this reaction will go ahead will depend upon what we call the Gibbs free energy. And the Gibbs free energy relates both the delta H and the entropy and is described as the available energy for a reaction to do work. And the Gibbs free energy gives us an idea whether or not the reaction will be spontaneous or non-spontaneous at a given temperature. The equation for delta G is delta G equals the enthalpy take away the temperature in Kelvin multiplied by the entropy. So the change in Gibbs free energy is defined in the same way as delta H. We can use the equation or we can simply do the Gibbs free energy of the products take away the Gibbs free energy of the reactants. A negative value for delta G represents a spontaneous reaction. A positive value for delta G represents a non-spontaneous reaction. And if the delta G equals zero, then this reaction would be at equilibrium. It's really important that you remember those two things. So here's a calculation involving delta G. Calculate the, delta, the Gibbs free energy of a reaction at 25 degrees Celsius with an enthalpy of negative 50 and an entropy of 142 joules, remember the joules, per mole. Comment on the spontaneity of the reaction. So for this one, we simply use the formula delta H take away the temperature times the entropy. In this case, the delta H was negative 50 kilojoules per mole. Take away the temperature in Kelvin, 298 
times by the entropy which I need to change to kilojoules to keep the units correct. And that would leave me with negative 92.3 kilojoules per mole as my answer. Now, what does that mean? I've got a negative value for delta G. So that means that this reaction would be spontaneous. This reaction will occur spontaneously because of its Gibbs free energy. Another example, propene reacts with hydrogen at 180 degrees in the presence of a nickel catalyst to give propane. Use the information below to determine the value for the free enthalpy change for this reaction, the delta G value. Now we haven't been given as much information here, but we've again been given some data. And from the data we need to work out the delta H, the enthalpy change, and then the delta S, the entropy change for the reaction. So the delta H naught would be the enthalpy of the products, take away the enthalpy of the reactants, and that will allow us to calculate the delta H to be negative 124 kilojoules per mole. The delta S value, the entropy, we can calculate that in the same way by doing the entropy of the products, take away the entropy of the reactants, we're given the values from this table, but if we weren't given them, we would refer to the data book. So 270 take away 267 plus 131 gives us negative 128 joules per Kelvin per mole. So that means this system is becoming more ordered because we have two gas moles on the left, one gas mole on the right. So now we have all the bits and pieces to calculate our Gibbs free energy. So Gibbs free energy equals the enthalpy, take away the Kelvin temperature times the entropy in kilojoules. Remember to change it to kilojoules, so many students will forget that. So negative 128 divided by 1000 would be negative 0.128. Once we've got the units correct, we can work out the Gibbs free energy or the free enthalpy change to work out if this reaction will be spontaneous or not. So at this temperature, this reaction will be spontaneous as the delta G is negative. The next question. At 180 degrees, this reaction is spontaneous and that's proved by the negative delta G value. Determine the temperature above which the reaction becomes non-spontaneous. So for a question like this, when they ask you to work out the temperature, we have to say let the delta G equal zero, kind of like the pivot point for this reaction. So let delta G equal zero, and then we need to solve the equation for T, and we call this the critical temperature. So we sub delta G equals zero into our delta G equation, and then we leave T as our unknown, and we just wanna rearrange this equation to solve for T. So as we go through and solve this equation, we can find that, and I think I might have made a little mistake there, it should be negative, but I think the calculation works out, that temperature equals 972 Kelvin, which is the critical temperature for this reaction to become non-spontaneous. So as you keep heating and heating this reaction, at some point it will become non-spontaneous. So we need to be able to predict what effect the change in temperature has on the entropy and enthalpy of a reaction and how that impacts the Gibbs free energy. So we have this little table that can help us identify how a temperature will change the reactions. So if we have a delta S, which is positive, so it's less ordered, and we have something that has a negative enthalpy, then that reaction will always be spontaneous. If we have something that is a negative delta S and a positive delta H, that will always be non-spontaneous. It's the two at the other quadrant of that particular table that are important to remember. I'll let you have a look at them, but remember that if we need to solve for T, if, if we wanna find the critical temperature, we need to solve for the temperature T. Just to finish off, a quick review of delta G in equilibrium, which popped up in topic. 17. Remember that the equilibrium, the K, has a value of 1, and the Gibbs free energy, the minimum of Gibbs free energy, would lie between the reactants and the products. Now if we have an equilibrium favouring the products, the minimum delta G value 
lies very close to the products. So that means that for the reactants to have a reverse reaction, we would need to overcome a lot of Gibbs free energy. It's a lot easier to turn into products because of the smaller Gibbs free energy than the larger Gibbs free energy. If we have equilibrium favoring reactants, that means the minimum Gibbs free energy lies very much towards the reactants. So it's much easier to turn into reactants than it is to turn into products. So volume three, some top tips. Make sure you know your positives and negatives. Make sure you can use the data book and a good understanding of the SL content always helps. Thanks for watching guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you.